Welcome everyone to the ICANS Conversation That Matters series um, on the topic, Navigating Human Challenges in Digital Transformations. I am very excited uh, to have my colleague, Shannon Atkins here today um, to give a brief introduction. Shannon Atkins was the CEO of Future State, uh, a boutique change consultancy acquired by Accenture in 2021. Uh, she currently leads the development and evolution of our change approaches at Accenture, and she serves as a strategic lead on the human elements of our work on digital transformations, particularly in life sciences across the West. Uh, she is a mom, an equestrian, a hiker, and she is located at in uh, Alameda, California. Um, to give a bit about myself, I am Noreen Aziz, a proud alumni of ICANS, and I've spent about 10 years of my career at the World Bank, um, and now it's about two and a half years, a little over two, at Accenture as an Associate Director in the Data and AI practice, and I'm based out of Virginia. Uh, and I don't have the exciting hobbies as <laughs> Shannon has being an equestrian, that's, that's really cool. Okay. Uh, so why have we chosen this topic today before we kick it off, right? Uh, the topic of navigating human challenges and digital transformations. Uh, we're seeing this, we're experiencing it in the organizations that we are part of. Um, they're embracing AI and digital technologies, right? It's at a, it's at a fast pace. It's, it's, a, it's a evolving at a fast pace, but it's, it's really not just about the workflows and the processes in these journeys. It is about the people within the organizations, right? When you think about workflows, when you think about processes, when you think about systems or technology platforms, those can often be the easier pieces, as complicated as they may be, given the size of an organization or the maturity of that organization in that journey. Uh, but the most key piece there to, which is critical for success is that human dimension, right? Does the organization understand the what and the why? Uh, and more so, do they understand the how? so that they are well equipped to adopt the new ways of working um, and kind of drive that transformation and culture forward, right? So we'll cover those topics and much more. Uh, Shannon is gonna talk from experience, make it real for you guys through examples. Uh, and we hope to really uh, get some good questions from you as well towards the end, and we'll try to weave them throughout as well. So over to you, Shannon, and thank you again for taking the time to be with us. I know you have a super busy schedule, so really appreciative of it. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Michael and Aziz, for having me. Noreen, for having me. Um, I I love what you started with. I was thinking about a story, actually. Um, it's a few years old now, but I was thinking about working with a life sciences client. Very, very, very smart end users. And all of our end users, of course, are very smart, very capable um, PhDs. And we were hired to drive the adoption of a planning tool. And as they presented the challenge to us there, they said, you know, we, we obviously need more training and more awareness and more communications for this platform because all that anybody is supposed to do is click a button and forward the data from the, from the receiving system to their desktop, click a button, forward it on along the process and nobody's clicking the button, which of course was initially a head scratcher of, feel like that's not hard. I don't think I don't think the, that they won't click the button is a matter of knowledge and skill and awareness. There's something else. There's a there's a hesitancy, there's a resistance, there's something behind this this unwillingness to do as asked, as asked to do. And so as we uncovered the challenges, it had nothing to do with the technology. The technology was perfectly simple to use. It was if I forward this information and it's incorrect, people's lives are affected. These clinical trials are affected. People may or may not get the medicines that they need. And I have no idea what algorithm is driving the answer that popped that screen in front of me for me to approve. So our solution wasn't to teach people how to use the technology or convince them that it was powerful. It was to go back and say, well, that's quite easy. Let us share with you the algorithm. And let us also make sure that you know that you don't have to double check it in your Excel spreadsheet. If for some reason it's incorrect, you are not going to be fired. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we want you to try and practice. So you're exactly right. The human factors and the human challenges, they're not necessarily as simple as I, as I don't know how or I don't want to change. They come gem, genuinely, they usually come from a place of deep concern and care 
for the well-being of the business or the well-being of customers. And we need to meet people where they're at and help them through these changes. So uh, really great, really great introduction. I will start with a few slides. And I'm just going to speak to really what we are noticing in and what we have noticed and probably what all of you have noticed as the key challenges for human beings as they embark upon transformational change. And it's a little different than the challenges that folks face when they're embarking upon incremental change or adoption of an upgrade of a system or moving from a version of a tool to the next. We're talking about a whole new world and um, this transformational change, as you mentioned, Noreen, it's not, it's not slowing down. Anybody who's leading in the 21st century has got to be adept at change and change will continue to be a core capability for everyone, whether you're on the human side of the business or on the technical side of your business, being good at change is critical. Um, are my slides showing up? Everything's visible? Yep. Sure. Okay, good. So just to this point, um, the acceleration of change, we all are feeling it. I'm sure that each of us on this call are feeling it just when you think you've mastered some new breakthrough in technology or some expectation of how you'll telecommute or how you'll manage your life work balance, something new is coming your way. And um, certainly we've seen this that since the pandemic, um, folks have overwhelmingly articulated a level of change fatigue. So this this real inability to adopt anything else new. In fact, there's a, a data, a piece of data that we have that shows that before the pandemic, 75% of the people within your organization said they were willing to go along with the change, whatever change it might be. They were willing to be adopting of the change. And that number is down to just 47%. This has nothing to do with change being done badly. This has to do with, I just, I can't take one more thing. I can't come along. So if we know that people are operating in a state of overwhelm and we know that the pace of change is not going to diminish, then we really have to start thinking about what is it going to take for us to be able to sustain this pace of change, take care of humans on that journey to drive those business results that we're looking at and looking to achieve. The pace of change is continuing at such an accelerated rate that we need to really think more creatively about how to meet people where they're at, um, provide them with the information and the support that they need to take on new ways of working, um, and recognize that this is iterative and ongoing. So where we may have used the words in the past of change management, now we're really just talking about change, aren't we? It's not about managing through the change. It's about becoming co-creators in the change and becoming capable of ongoing and continuous change. So if we look to slide uh, three, what we've understood then is that there are a number of attributes of organizations that will thrive in a state of continuous change. Those organizations that will not only you know, change because they have to, but will really leverage this opportunity to leapfrog their competition, to create environments where people feel seen, heard, and a part of the future, um, and to really maximize the business outcomes of their, of their transformational efforts. Um, I won't read every, every bit of content here, but hopefully they'll really resonate with you when we talk about connected and empowered. That's, not, that's to say that we're no longer you know, making change happen from a top-down only way. Rather, we're connecting the top through the middle and to the front line. And change can be originated from any point in that ecosystem. And what's required then is that everyone, and I think Noreen, you'll say this is a big part of what's possible with our data and AI transformations uh, of the 21st century, is what becomes important and critical is that everyone in the organization has clarity on the purpose and the direction, where we're going and why and what good looks like, and access to the data and insights needed to make real-time decisions um, and to experiment and refine. So these organizations are also adaptive and scaled. They're continuously sensing what's needed in the market and adapting their solutions with innovation and with speed. They're integrated around outcomes. I spoke to this a bit earlier. It isn't just at the C-suite, but really every, or every person within the organization has to understand what are we driving towards? How do I play a part in that? and what does good look like across boundaries, across silos, um, and across hierarchy. We are gonna leverage as much automation and augmentation as we can 
because that, that accelerates our ability to drive impact. And when we're integrated around outcomes, we can recognize more quickly when something isn't working and shift, and that's gonna be incredibly important. In order to do that, we're gonna be building and forming teams in a much more dynamic way. Teams are not going to be static. They're going to be created and, and um, built up in service of an emergent need. And in order to do that with velocity, we have to be organizations that are both skills and aspiration driven. So we need to understand the capabilities of every individual, every team, every component of our, of our organizational architecture so that we can form, unform, and reform teams as needed. And these teams are not just who's inside our four walls of an, as an organization. These teams are ecosystem powered. So where are we partnering? How are we thinking about third parties? How are we thinking about academic institutions? How are we bringing more to the table to create more compelling solutions? And ultimately recognizing that we must consistently self-disrupt how we are working, how we're collaborating, and what we're achieving together. There are a few, if you go to the next slide, the human and machine relationship, teams of teams, and rigid jobs of food skills, just to kind of bring this home. There are three core foundations of organizations that will thrive through constant change. The first is the real recognition that the transformation upon us relative to technology, to generative AI, to data and transformation of data, is that it's no longer a matter of human beings needing to adopt a solution or a tool or a technical capability. It's really about human beings being capable of maximizing their relationship and the relationship of teams with those machines. So that the, for the first time, now that our technology is really becoming much more human-like, we really do see this shifting from a matter of adopt new technology to partner and team with technology. So again, resetting that base unit of performance from the individual contributor who's learning how to use a new piece of software to a team, unlocking the power of generative AI, unlocking the power of technology to accelerate, optimize, and deliver even more outstanding results. And again, kind of that third piece, anchoring in on the importance of skills, because jobs and roles are much more dynamic in the 21st century than they've ever been before. So understanding skills and building skills to form and unform those teams is critical to success. So what we'll see is that we'll spend more time building the competencies of a team than building the competencies of an individual. This is a really significant shift and how we think about talent in the 21st century. Um, moving to slide five, you'll see a little bit more about what needs to be rethought, how we organize our work. Again, we might be moving away from functionally led organizations to initiative or problem or challenge led organizations with more fluid structures and flatter and more empowered teams who are leveraging common sets of data and understanding what the insights and data are telling them and then working together to collaborate and solve key problems. How we lead is going to really be changing um, and has been changing. So um, any leader in the 21st century who thinks the way to get outcomes and results is to tell people what to do is really missing the opportunity to unlock the power and the creativity and the innovation and the capacity of their workforce. Um, so our job as leaders becomes more and more about being a coach, being a catalyst, um, being a guide to support folks in achieving their outcomes. Um, and that means that we'll really be looking to multiply our talent. How do we think about skills and skill building? How do we support folks in experimenting and shifting to new opportunities? How do we make it easier to get work done? And how do we create a more self-driven model? Ultimately, building out this, this muscle around continuous change and reinvention, smaller, faster batches of change where everyone plays a role in that change, everyone has a seat at the table, and everyone is a co-creator in the future. Um, and what we, what we, you know, what we spoke about first, what Noreen brought up first, looking at slide six, is that you know these are the human factors of change. This isn't about the competencies, the capabilities of technology. It, it's there. This is about us building the competencies in, in leaders, building the alignment, breaking down the silos creating the skills and talents needed within our organization to really maximize this opportunity. Um, and so what I'll just say, say in, in, in on slide seven, if we're there now, is that 
what, what we've noticed is that, you know, these are pretty simple concepts. They're quite intuitive. In fact, if you think about any change you've needed to run as a family or as a team, it's always been about getting everyone into the game, having folks see themselves in that future, creating that compelling view, vision of the future, working together to hardwire that and build the skills and develop the sustainability program. So it's, it's simple to conceptualize and yet sometimes very hard for us to build the rigor um, in order to drive that long-term change and sustainable change. Some of the things that we see are really making a difference is thinking about the function of a transformation office as a capability that needs to persist. So not project-based, but as an ongoing capability for an enterprise, embedding people into the core of our future, making them the folks that are really, you know, designing and imagining that future and architecting that future, enhancing our digital core um, and sparking the movement so that folks can build that digital core and, and run forward with it. So that's just a little bit about what we're noticing in terms of the state change. Noreen, I'll leave it, I'll open it up to questions. Um, anything that's emerging um, as people have been, you know, contemplating some of what I've been sharing already. Yeah, no, thank you, Shannon, for that. This is great, right? Um, can you talk a little bit maybe about how transformational change would differ from simple technological upgrades, right? And why this distinction is crucial. And when it comes to employee morale and engagement and, you know, the actual culture of it, right? What do we need to be careful about? What do we need? What are the best practices from some of your real examples that, that folks need to think about to make the transformation successful, right? And bring along the people. Yeah, I'll share a few examples, a few stories. It's a, it's a really important inflection point change. I think when I started doing change work in 2010, um, it was possible to imagine a change in which you could see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Mm -hmm. What's going to be different at the end? What is explicitly going to be changed? When you started, you knew where you were going, and you could imagine being able to tell people, here's where we're going, this is what it's going to look like, and here's what's expected of you. We would call that linear change, maybe an upgrade to a new software platform that you're already on, maybe mm -hmm. the addition of a new technology, maybe a new org change that you've already kind of imagined. Oh, we've got to build our marketing team. Um, perhaps a, a, a new CEO or a new, new leadership change. What's happening today is that when we start change, it's much more amorphous. So I'll take the example of a client that I've worked with, again, in life science. This is a big part of my, my practice. Um, this particular client noticed that with the diminishment of patents in their own portfolio, um, their, their blockbuster drugs coming off patent, that they were going to need to drastically accelerate their ability to deliver in a customer-centric way. They were no longer going to be able to count on just the blockbuster drug, and they were going to need to empower their organization at the point of interaction with the physicians and the, and the doctor's offices. They didn't know exactly what needed to be different in those frontline relationships. And they recognized that the functional leaders or the C-suite were not actually in the right role to imagine those new interactions and those new ways of working. That the folks most appropriate to design and imagine those new ways of working were the folks at the frontline that were currently engaging with those customers. And in fact, the customers themselves in a co-creative way. So instead of starting with a set of new processes, new procedures, new technologies that were going to be rolled out and people being told they must adopt, the program really started from a place of what are our guiding principles of how we want the future to be and feel for our customers and what are the skills that our teams need in order to be able to experiment, design, refine, and launch new ways of working within their unique markets? And so the, in, the transformation office moved from something that was really a, a set of programs or projects that were being delivered and which people were being trained on and scaled up to a set of experimentation capabilities that were rolled out to these frontline teams and the space for them to co-create with their customers 
to imagine the portfolios of change. So it was very amorphous, very ambiguous where we were headed. We just knew we needed to change. That mm-hmm. takes a whole different different set of skills, a whole different set of toler, a whole different level of tolerance within the organization to live in ambiguity, to test, experiment, refine, and move if things aren't proving out the case. It also takes the ability to have some rigor around what are the outcomes that we're seeking and how will we know we're on track and it's time to scale. So building those competencies within individuals, teams, and the system itself. It also required a more dynamic resource allocation. So we're no longer thinking about an annual planning process Mm -hmm. or even a quarterly planning process. We're thinking about ongoing evolution of the portfolio of changes, prioritizing and deprioritizing based on the impact that we're having with customers and building that competency into the teams and into our operating mechanisms and into our operating structure. So it's, it's almost like a completely new capability And what we notice is that people who are going to be interacting with those customers are at the point of imagining the future, creating those experiments, and then scaling them into into adoption. The traditional change management activities of training, comms, um, what else am I thinking, you know, training, communications, uh, incentives, and rewards, those matter, those always matter, but they become less critical to getting started. We can just start and learn together collectively as we move down this path of transformational change. Is that resonating? Does that make sense? Does yeah. it bring up any other further questions? No, no, that, that's fantastic. That, that That's really uh, helpful for the audience here as well to see the differences and how this whole space is evolving from a change perspective too, right? And you mentioned something earlier on in terms of, uh, you know, for the organization, the rest of the organization to know that, north star vision right that overall kind of uh goal outcome Uh, and oftentimes you're very right right we've seen it time and again gaps occur when that is as the foundational piece is missing or not well understood across all the layers which you also pointed out that's critical right so how have you seen organizations ensuring that their, you know, transformation efforts are aligned with that overall business goal and value? And how do they ensure that it gets not just communicated, but then understood by the various layers, right? And the roles and the folks yeah. that have a critical role to play to drive it uh, as that, you know, a first, first layer, if you will, right? Maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. And if, if, if slide eight might still be up, I'm not sure if it is because I can't see, but if slide eight is still up, you can see these three circles. Imagine your imagine the future spark a movement and bed lasting change. And you can see that they are repeating loops. Um, and that's that we're trying to at least represent them as repeating loops. And that that's because at every pass we're going we're going deeper and we're going deeper. So perhaps in a typical transformation program, the C suite gets together, they imagine a bold vision, they create a rally cry, they cascade it to the C-suite minus one, the C-suite minus one, maybe they understand it fully, but they didn't create it. So they have just a little bit less skin in the game. And then they need to cascade it to their direct reports. And then it becomes even a little bit more (laughs) diluted Mm. or complicated. And by the time we get to frontline teams, this is just one more change that you've been talking to me about. And it's no different than the last one. And I don't really understand why I should pay attention. What we (laughs) want to be doing instead is all of those activities, imagine the possible assess reality aligned on prior priorities, are occurring across all layers of the organization. We've called it weaving at times. So you can't do this top down. This has to be all levels of the organization simultaneously. Now, let's be realistic. That's not going to be in a 40,000 person organization. It's not going to be 40,000 people. But how do you think about the personas impacted by this change or the personas that are going to be a part of designing this change? And how do you have the right representation in each of these dialogues through the Imagine the Future and through Sparking a Movement so that really everyone is in the game that needs to be in the game, whether it's them individually or the persona who best represents them. And they're designing those experiments and they're getting their hands in the pie. I'm thinking mixing metaphors perhaps, but they're, they're engaging deeply in the problem and imagining that solution so that ultimately the leaders have less to, less 
but less they're doing less in the how and they're they're sparking that why and people are owning that why my favorite example of this with a client was a ceo who joined an organization mid transformation and he himself did not resonate with the why and had to do the work to really make it his own and make it his own story why are we embarking on this transformational change why does it matter and then mm -hmm. recognize the power of being able to put that story in his own words and realizing that actually that was the critical differentiator. It isn't that everyone in the organization adopts his words. It's that everyone in the organization has their words for why this transformation matters. And yes, of course, there's consistent core messages that are going to carry through. But how do you take a real pulse of the organization and bring them in? We've got some resources at Accenture that we've used, things like our water cooler experiment, where you're really capturing what are people actually saying today. Let's use yeah. that as the starting part for our messaging, not what the execs want them to be saying. What are we saying and how do we want to capture that, evolve that, and turn that into the power of the organization? So you're at, and then another very tactical, you know, successful solution that we've seen deployed by organizations, you know, ranging from Google to really probably every other majorly successful technology company that's moving at that pace of change is instead of taking a quarterly metrics and outcomes or a long-term retrospective view of when we're successful, we will have grown revenue 32%. That's great. Wonderful. But what is our short-term indication that we're on the right path? So we've seen, seen great success with the OKR framework, the Objectives and Key Results Framework, which is at a, a, a level one is the starting point. What are our objectives and key resort, results for the coming quarter? But then that's translated so that every team can take those level one OKRs and make them their own. So for our team, in service of those level one OKRs, what are our quarterly OKRs? And it isn't about hitting them all, it's about learning from them. So one of the OKRs might be engage with 42 customers in co-creation sessions. That's an outcome, mm -hmm. or that's a key result that we're gonna deliver, and the outcome is greater client intimacy. intimacy. Right, right. Well, right. maybe in the process you learn that your customers don't want to talk to you. Well, you didn't achieve the outcome, but you learned something. So mm -hmm. now as you go to think about how are we going to achieve that outcome of greater customer intimacy, all right, the co-creation sessions wasn't it. What is it going to be? How are we going to do this next? What do we want to – because we still have that objective. So we increase the frequency and we increase the level of participation in goal setting and outcome setting and ownership of those outcomes on that pathway to the, mm -hmm. to the future state. No, that's fantastic. Yeah, that differentiation between output and outcome, I think that attention really makes makes it uh, is a critical piece for sure. Uh, it, it makes yeah. the journey smoother. Uh, we have some good questions here in the chat, uh, Shannon. I'll read them out and you can reflect a little bit there. Um, we've got one that says, have you seen pronounced differences across cultures and or regions, or do you typically see that the biggest obstacle and their solutions to the human element in these transformations are more or less universal? That's a really good question. I do see differences. I think that there are cultures in which hierarchical ways of interacting are more embedded. And there's a, there's a longer journey ahead to begin to um, build the trust within the organization that hierarchy is not as, va is not as valued mm -hmm. as innovation, creativity, co-creation engagement. Um, so I have seen some organizations might receive this information and say, that is just too radical for us. So then we would say, all right, within the program team, that's driving the transformation. Maybe it's not the entire organization. Within the program team, how might you shift towards more co-creation, more collaboration, more ideation? And we might suggest a structured workshop to help people build those muscles and build those skills of mm -hmm. hypothesis generation. Um, designing experiments, running experiments, um, and to start to build that movement one success story at a time uh, and, and to build that, build that case that, in fact, this can work even within an organization that has been a more rigid, more hierarchical, top-down organization for 
for forever, <laughs> you know, for a very yeah. long time. It's really embedded in that way of working. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We have another question. I'm going to try to take some real quick since we're uh, kind of coming to the end of this. Uh, we have a question from Joe Kosky. In my field, we've approached change from the lens of adopt, adapt, or discard. That works for the linear change model that Shannon mentioned. What are some techniques to get leaders, decision makers, to adjust their thinking on change? Well, I think it was adopt, adapt, and what was the third? Discard. Adopt, adapt, some, discard. Yeah. And discard. Yeah, I think there could be some value in that framework. I think it, it becomes a matter of how is it, how are those decisions being made? Maybe the, the, the distinctions adopt, adapt, discard are quite valuable, but who's in the room making, providing the input and how are we leveraging data? Mm -hmm. So if you and I, Noreen, we both look at the same data, I've, I've always found this fascinating, right? We look at the exact same data and I say, wow, look at that. We're on track. We're making progress. And you look at the exact same data and you say, no, we're not. We should be further ahead. <laughs> and so yeah. how do we create the, the forums and the dialogue and the discourse? How do we have those OKRs established up front? How do we create the rigor around the retrospectives and the forums to discuss what results have been produced? What momentum do we see? What hypothesis does that lead us to in terms of adapt, adopt, or discard? Who is in the room? Are the folks closest to the work, closest to the customer getting an equal say as those that are in the executive ivory towers? And how are we learning as we go about our own decision-making processes? <laughs> like, whoops, wow, look at that. We have a tendency to always say we're going to adapt when in fact, mm we're really underutilizing discard. We need to build our muscle around discard. Let's think about that. What prevents us from discarding those things which have not produced results? How do we need to build that confidence? So I think the, the frame might be right. I'd ask about the structures, the mechanisms, and the participation. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that also. Uh, another quick one from Marbella Silverio. Uh, routine and long established policies continue to dominate in the workplace. People view uncertainty or enterprise as a threat rather than an opportunity. How do we overcome these barriers that will cultivate our interest and identify the gaps in our knowledge? Yeah, I, I think this is where I think this, this team as the unit of performance versus individual as the unit of performance is critically important. So. When I think of my success as only my success, mm -hmm. then I'm more inclined to want to do what I know I'm great at already or what I've already developed mastery of. When my unit of success is the performance of my team and that team could be a semi-permanent team, we could think of that as function or organizational process deliverers, um, when I am incentivized and actually rewarded for the performance of the team, and I'm able to maybe bring my, I'm a steward of the past, I see value in the way we've been doing things, but there are others on the team that see value in disruption, and we're able to collectively collaborate towards a shared outcome in the future, I become more willing to try something on that's new and different, um, especially if we can create that in a way that the experiment is safe. We can we can say, hey, we're going to pilot this in one process with one customer. If it works, we'll scale it up. We're not going to disrupt just for disruption's sake, but let's see if we can take, take something and make it better um, because we know there's pain here or we know it's inefficient or we know that it's pain. One, one little data point that's in the slides that I was sharing, I don't know if you all saw it, is that since the 70s, which is when we really did start digital transformation, now, uh, GDP – by employee and you know, productivity, GDP has actually gone down. I believe our hypothesis, our current working hypothesis is because we haven't simultaneously created accountability for teams to receive these new technologies and leverage them as an opportunity for the team's performance to improve. So if we see technology as an unlock to team productivity versus individual productivity, I think some of this resistance moves away. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if that gets you 100% to the answer, but that's, that's where our thinking is going right now. Super. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shannon, so much. I think, uh, are, are we at time here, Michael, or do we, we have a little bit more? Uh, we are at time. Uh, okay. I think that, so that should, uh, that will conclude our um, conversations that matter for today. Uh, awesome. Thank you again, uh, Shannon, and uh, thank you for yes, your flexibility. I'm so sorry work for my yeah. technology. I apologize, everyone. Please forgive me. That's no problem at all. And no thank worries. you, Noreen, for leading the conversation today. And thanks to everybody who joined us. Uh, it was great to have you all. Um, and uh, please reach out if you have any other questions. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Shannon. Take care, everyone. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.